I may have bitten off more than I can chew. <laughs> so, when I first did part one, I suggested that, hmm, maybe, maybe I can be the guy in our community, the kind of comics explained, comic story and guy who covers this series for people who may be interested in it, but don't want to shill out for a weekly $4 series event type thing about a bunch of Avengers characters that nobody really cares about, if we're being completely honest. I mean, there's some okay, some pretty good characters in here, but um, the way that the team has been formed, the way that the way that these people interact with each other and come together, uh, there's just not a whole lot to, like, latch on to. Um, so the idea behind No Surrender was this was going to be the big turning point for Avengers. No more um, three different teams that no one cares about. It's just, you know, one big Avengers conglomerate, essentially. No more hero versus hero. It's, it's them fighting uh, not only Grandmaster and whomever Grandmaster is sparring with, but also... All these guys here, these these twelve supervillains, um, and so this was just trying them trying to get back to their sort of what Avengers are known for. There's no real reason though. <laughs> There's been no justification for why this had to be sixteen parts. Because um, so far in each issue, you really only had one or two things happen, which that's just a really unfortunate side effect of writing for the trade, but. Uh, <laughs> It's not at all clear why the story had to be told in 16 parts and not 6. Um, so the team is the same before, including the artist, who has kind of grown on me. I'll give him that. Like in the first video I did of this, I was kind of giving him some crap because some of the faces were kind of wonky. And some of the faces are still kind of wonky. But overall, I actually am starting to really like his art. Yeah, so basically the things that happened in this book, um, or in this issue rather, is that... So in the last issue, Quicksilver tried to intervene to uh, recover some of his pride. Um, <clears throat> and just as he did that, uh, Wanda, Maximoff, and, uh, what was it, Brother Voodoo tried to undo this stasis effect that has afflicted uh, apparently random assortment of Avengers and has prevented them from doing anything. And the second that they were able to bring the vision out of stasis... Uh, Quicksilver went into stasis, and there hasn't been any apparent uh, rhyme or reason to who was picked, but as we find out here, it seems like whomever was picked, it seems like they actually were picked for a reason, because the effect doesn't last very long. Uh, Vision goes from being, you know, normal to being back in stasis, and then Quicksilver comes out of the uh, state that he was in. It's also worth noting that um, the person who teleports Quicksilver back to Avengers HQ is the new character Voyager, and although Vision goes back into you know whatever state this is, uh, he doesn't seem to recognize her. So kind of proving that her presence isn't a retcon, it's uh, somebody messing with the timeline. So what else? Uh, and then they find out that the two teams of supervillains are going after these pyramid-shaped things. And the supervillains seem to know what's going on, but the Avengers don't. They're just there to act as what Grandmaster and them, the, what Grandmaster calls uh, obstacles. So one of the dudes from one of the teams of supervillains, it's like when you actually look at who these, these people are, these two teams that are fighting each other, um, you basically have all these guys here. They call these the Black Order. That's from Jonathan Hickman's run. And these guys were like Thanos' flunkies during Infinity and in the lead up to Infinity. And then you have the Lethal Legion, which half of these characters are brand new. Um, I think one of them is a... It's a new version of an old character. And then you have the Blood Brothers, who also used to be Thanos' henchmen... And Captain Glory, who I guess was in Grant Morrison's Marvel Boy series, and he's like the Cree version of Captain America. So they're, you know, you have one team that's known to be almost unstoppable. Like it took every single Avenger, all of them, even the, all the reservists, all the different teams, um, every possible Avenger. It took all of them to stop these guys. 
here. And then you just have this group of weirdos. <laughs> so it, it just seems kind of random in that way. And then the one guy from the Hickman Super Team, he grabs this pyramid that they were fighting over and he blows up. Then in the other part of the world, they make a play. The, the same thing happens. They make a play for the pyramid thing. And instead, it's Johnny Storm that touches it rather than one of the supervillains. So is he going to explode like that guy did? Who knows? I honestly did not know that Johnny Storm was in this book. Uh, I've read the three issues prior to this, and I don't remember him at all. Um, we find out a little bit more about Grandmaster and whomever this guy is that he's sparring off with. But the only thing that we learn from this is that these two seem to have a long history together. Is this guy... I just assumed that this guy was Kang the Conqueror or Immortus or um, maybe a different version of Kang that we hadn't seen before, but I guess we'll find out at some point. Not necessarily anytime soon. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> I really don't know how I'm going to stretch these out. Uh, and just instead of just simply summarizing what has happened. Once again, I'm calling shenanigans on this because this guy, Metal Master, is able to control the Uru Metal in Thor's Hammer. And as far as I'm concerned, lifting Thor's Hammer using mental powers is no different than lifting it with your arm. So he shouldn't be able to do this. You can affect it when it's in flight. It's really hard to do, but you can affect it if it's already in flight. So maybe that's what they're going with, but... Um, it doesn't seem to be it. Uh, I don't know. It, I don't understand this new Red Hulk. What I, what happened to Thunderbolt Ross? Wasn't he Red Hulk? I, I don't know. <laughs> so many questions. Um, I still hate this costume on Scarlet Witch. I know they've had this costume for, like, over five years now. I just, I still hate it. Um... Other than that, the only thing I thought was notable, because the writers for this are uh, Mark Wade, Al Ewing, and Jim Zub. In the last issue, at the in the last page, we learned a little bit more about Jim Zub's take on the Avengers. Let's see. So here we're learning about Al Ewing. Al Ewing was the writer on U.S. Avengers, so they spotlight. The U.S. Avengers, I don't know who any of these people are. Um, even the ones I do know, I, I really don't know what they've been up to recently. But this part is interesting. Al Ewing's top five Avengers stories. Now, they did this last issue with Jim Zub. And all of Jim Zub's picks were fairly conventional. I'd heard of all but like one or two of them. Uh, the ones I, I hadn't read, I still knew about. He picked stuff like the Kree Scroll War and Avengers Forever and uh, what was it where they met the where they went into Scarlet Witch's backstory, whatever that story was called. Um, so they, you know, they were fairly conventional picks, but these are all really weird. Um, his top five Avenger stories. One is a What If from, uh, gosh, this must be from the early '80s. Avengers Annual number 14, which was, uh, I guess, a, a tie-in to Secret Wars 2. Um, Hickman's run on, very recent run on Avengers. This is the only, like, I've never heard of this story, but based on the talent involved, um, Avengers versus the Gods of Olympus, uh, I'm, that sounds like it could be pretty cool. I just don't, I've never heard of it. And then there's this book for kids. So these are like really weird picks. And it makes me think that his knowledge of uh, Avengers is pretty slim, relatively speaking. Um, that's not always a bad thing. Like put, taking in, you know, writers that sort of know about this stuff but don't have a deep knowledge of it. You can get some very interesting takes from that. A lot of people seem to like Al Ewing. I know he blocked me on Twitter even though I never interacted with him. But it's it's a little bit... Strange that uh, that he he has five stories to choose from, and he picks at least are not exactly classics. So there's a cover for the next issue, the next couple of issues. Um, yeah, that's that's all I've got to say. It's just so it's so 
decompressed. It's so it's paced so slowly. I mean, it, you know, you look at these pages, it looks like there's a lot happening, but it's like it's just basically this one extended fight sequence that I, I don't even remember what this accomplishes, and then that leads to this other extended fight sequence, and then there's a plot point that Vision, who uh, has not apparently been affected by the timeline, doesn't know who Voyager is, that's something. Um, that's something. And that's something. And that's it. That's all that happens uh, in this issue. So I, I just really don't know what to comment on. Um, it's very difficult to... I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep doing this. Uh, just saying it's very meh for the next 12 weeks going on. I don't know if, how I could do that. Um, but tell me if you're reading this. Tell me if these videos are interesting or not. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, in any case, this is Unranked Chevron signing off.